expanding pelvic organ prolapse. I think it's so important for us to discuss this topic because so often I have clients coming to me and there's so much fear surrounding pelvic organ prolapse. Um, and there are so many Facebook groups that sort of um, are so well intended and you know want to support group, but I want to support people, but I find that very often it leads to catastrophic thinking. And I think it's important to share um, current and accurate information with people and, and, and to let women and men as well know that there is healing possible for pelvic organ prolapse. So let's, let's talk about pelvic organ prolapse and what is it? What exactly is pelvic organ prolapse? And what it is, it's a weakness of the connective tissue of the walls of the vagina, which cause the pelvic organs to descend from their anatomical position. So there's a weakening, there's a laxity, a laxity in the connective tissue, which causes one or more of the organs to descend from their anatomical position. There are different kinds of prolapse, and we'll talk about um, the different kinds of prolapse um, that are common. Here's my little handy dandy picture that I made. Bear with me for a minute. Um, so this is normal anatomy. Here you can see the pelvic floor muscles, the pubic bone, the tailbone, the pelvic floor muscles are shaped like a hammock to support the pelvic organs in their anatomical position. We have the bladder here, the uterus and the, the vaginal opening and the lower rectum. A cystocele is an anterior pelvic organ prolapse where the bladder falls from its anatomical position um, down into the vaginal wall. So there is a, a weakening in the connective tissue in the front or the anterior portion of the vaginal wall and the, the bladder um, falls into the, the vaginal wall and that's called a cystocele. Then we have a rectocele, which is um, a posterior weakening of the, the connective tissue in the posterior wall of the vagina. And that can cause the rectum to almost herniate or fall into the posterior wall of the vaginal canal. And we have a uterine prolapse, which is more central, the uterus herniates or falls into the lining, um, the walls of the um, vagina because they are um, weakened and can no longer support it. Enterocele is um, a prolapse of the intestines, which is much less common. Um, and I, I have not seen an enterocele in my practice. The most common is a cystocele, um, but rectoceles and uterine prolapses are also fairly common. And then we have a vaginal vault prolapse, where the entire vaginal vault um, prolapses because of the weakening of the the walls of that, the vagina. Um, risk factors associated with prolapse, why would somebody develop a prolapse? So common reasons are childbirth, prolonged pushing where there's a lot of pressure and tension on the pelvic floor, genetics. So some people have collagen disorders or, um, like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, where they have a laxity in the connective tissue genetically. Surgery, um, some pelvic organ surgeries can, pro can um, make you predisposition to have a prolapse. Um, chronic constipation, so we'll talk about that more in a little bit, but constant straining from constipation can also lead to pelvic organ prolapse. Um, poor management of intra-abdominal pressure can lead to pelvic organ prolapse. Trauma, 
um, repeated heavy lifting with poor technique, and menopause is a common um, predisposing risk factor for pelvic organ prolapse because we lose estrogen in the menopausal period. Um, so those are just some of um, risk factors that can lead to pelvic organ prolapse. What are some common symptoms that people describe when they have pelvic organ prolapse? So the most common symptom that women um, come to my office with is they say they feel a feeling of heaviness, a feeling of pressure in the perineum. They feel, they say they have a feeling of falling out or that they actually feel the organ falling um, and they feel it in the opening of their vagina. Some women have urinary symptoms such as urinary um, frequency, hesitancy. They feel like their stream is slower. Um, many times people feel like they have a post-void dribble, so they feel like they can't get all of the urine out. Many women have report an increase in discharge, um, and some people with uterine prolapses can even experience some vaginal bleeding. A lot of women feel um, a, a feeling of bulging or dragging. Low back pain is a common symptom of pelvic organ prolapse. So this could be very tricky for people because um, they have low back pain, they'll go through the traditional pelvic floor route um, and they're not properly diagnosed um, because they haven't gone to a pelvic floor therapist. Um, but, pelvic, but low back pain is a common symptom of pelvic organ prolapse. Another symptom is common UTIs or infection can lead to pelvic, um, can be a symptom of pelvic organ prolapse. And a lot of women just say they feel a heaviness in their perineum. It feels heavy. They feel heavier as the day goes on. Um, many women with rectocele say they have difficulty evacuating stool and actually um, feel that they have to use a technique called splinting to help evacuate the stool. Um, and that's when they put a finger or a device into the vaginal wall in the back to sort of encourage the lower rectum to go back into an its anatomical possession and allow the stool to be fully evacuated. So many women with erectocele feel a feeling of incomplete evacuation or difficulty completely voiding. Um, women can feel urinary hesitancy or, you know, a stop and start stream. Some people may feel like they have to change positions in order to fully eliminate the void. Um, and the interesting thing about prolapse is that some people can be asymptomatic and still um, have a pelvic organ prolapse. And some people can be, um, you know, feel very symptomatic and not have a significant degree of prolapse. So the degree of prolapse doesn't always correlate with the bothersome of the prolapse. So it's not always, um, there's not already always a correlation with how much the prolapse bothers them and how significant the prolapse presents. Um, when we talk about the grading of pelvic organ prolapse, there is usually, um, we usually grade prolapse with four grades. The POP-Q is a system that most people use. It's kind of like the gold standard for evaluating uh, prolapse. And there are four grades. Grade zero means no prolapse. It's completely normal anatomy. Grade one prolapse means that the prolapse is greater than a centimeter higher than the hymen. We use the hymen as a, a point of reference for grading prolapse. So grade one would be more than a centimeter above the hymen. Grade two would be a centimeter above or a centimeter below the hymen in terms of the prolapse. So there is some variability with grade two prolapses. Grade three would be more than a centimeter beyond the hymen, and grade four is complete eversion or prolapse. Um, 
of the pelvic organ. But again, many women um, don't feel that their symptoms are, physical therapists and research has shown that the degree of symptoms and the degree of bothersome don't always correlate with the degree of the pelvic organ prolapse. So how do we assess pelvic organ prolapse as physical therapists? So we always evaluate, we, we try to evaluate the prolapse in the position where the client feels the symptoms are most bothersome. So I always evaluate the person. Initially, I'll evaluate the person lying down with an empty bladder, and I'll just view the pelvic floor. Typically with a pelvic organ prolapse, you'll see that the opening of the introitus, the opening of the vagina is larger, a little more gaping. Um, so you want to visualize the anatomy externally. And then I'll ask the person to pull up and in because I want to see the contraction of the muscles. And then I want to see a maximal bearing down. I want the person to bear down as if they're pushing out a bowel movement or pushing out a baby because I want to see the degree of prolapse when there is maximal bearing down on the pelvic floor. Um, and then I'll ask the person usually to sneeze or cough. Um, and I do that with my fingers inserted and depending on which organ I want to assess, I will either put, distract a little bit of pressure posteriorly or anteriorly on the pelvic floor to view the pelvic organ that I'm looking at. I think it's really important to note that most physical therapists will evaluate a pelvic organ prolapse in lying down. First, I do that initially because it's more comfortable for the client and I wanna sort of get a sense of what's going on, but pelvic organ prolapse is dependent on gravity. So I will always get my clients up in a standing position and then assess the pelvic organ prolapse in Standing. And again, in a gravity um, dependent position, I will have them contract because I want to see how well and efficiently their pelvic floor muscles are engaging. And then in a gravity dependent position in standing, I will have the person bear down and um, bulge to see what that pelvic organ looks like when the person is standing and they're gravity is working sort of against them, pushing the pelvic organ down. And very often there is a big difference in how the person looks lying down and standing up. So um, assessing pelvic organ prolapse in different positions is really important and much more functional. So that's really important. Um, the first thing that I think it's important for people to understand about pelvic organ prolapse is that it's not just a pelvic floor, pelvic organ issue in isolation. Pelvic organ prolapse is a postural control issue and it's a pressure management issue. It's so important to understand that. So when we talk about pelvic organ prolapse being a postural control issue, that's really, really important because remember from our previous conversations that the pelvic floor and the respiratory diaphragm work together synergistically with our breath in order to manage intra-abdominal pressure. If you don't understand that, or you haven't been to my office, because I know if you've been a patient of mine, I most certainly have explained that dynamic to you, is that when you inhale and the lungs fill with air, that growing volume of air in our lungs pushes the respiratory diaphragm down, 
that in turn causes our abdominal contents to go down and it makes our pelvic floor descend as well. So ideally our diaphragm and our pelvic floor should be working synergistically together. We inhale, everything moves down, we exhale and everything shortens and recoils. In order for that to happen efficiently, our muscles, our joints, and our bodies have to be in optimal alignment. We have to be in a rib cage over the pelvic position in order for the breath to allow and efficiently encourage the exchange of pressure in our intra-abdominal cavity. So postural control is very important. There was actually a study done that showed for every degree of kyphosis, pelvic organ prolapse increased by, I think it was like 1.32%. So posture and postural control and optimizing posture is directly related to pressure management. So we want to make sure that the pelvis is in neutral alignment, that the Rib cage is sitting over the pelvis, and that um, that the diaphragm and the pelvic floor are exchanging pressure optimally to manage intra-abdominal pressure. The other really important concept in treating pelvic organ prolapse is pressure management. So pressure, managing intra-abdominal pressure is a key and foundational concept when we're talking about pelvic organ prolapse rehabilitation. Um, and what that means is, again, when we breathe, breath is what leads the management of intra-abdominal pressure. When we inhale, our abdominal contents go down, they lengthen, they expand, they broaden, and intra-abdominal pressure is increased. We exhale and everything shortens and recoils and we release that pressure. So we want to think of exhalation as blowing off pressure or blowing off intra-abdominal pressure. This is important because we want to make sure that we're managing intra-abdominal pressure through functional movements. A lot of people use breath holding as a strategy for stability, and that's not the best strategy because what you're doing when you're breath holding is that you're holding on to that pressure you're holding on to that increased intra-abdominal pressure, and then you're doing something that requires exertion. And what I always tell my clients is that it's not gonna be that one time you hold your breath and do something that's difficult, that's gonna cause a pelvic organ prolapse. It's gonna be those things that you do over and over and over again that's going to weaken that connective tissue through constant straining and pressure down through the pelvic floor. So we want to make sure that we're always breathing and exchanging pressure and managing intra-abdominal pressure well through the breath. That's really, really important. So postural control is a um, foundational component in managing pelvic organ prolapse. Um, managing intra-abdominal pressure is really important in managing um, pelvic organ prolapse. And that leads us to preventing constipation. So chronic constipation is a risk factor for pelvic organ prolapse because again, it's that constant bearing down and pushing the pelvic organ, the pelvic organ down, downward. It's that constant downward pressure. So we want to manage intra-abdominal pressure. We want to prevent constipation. We want to prevent co chronic constipation. But as physical therapists for anybody with um, pelvic organ prolapse, teaching clients 
optimal defecation mechanics is really, really important and making sure that people are not breath holding when they're trying to have a bowel movement and they're breathing throughout and keeping their pelvic floor muscles relaxed during urination and defecation. Um, we will look at, when we look at pelvic organ prolapse, we'll look at your breath strategy. So we talked about posture, we talked about intra-abdominal pressure, but we also want to make sure that the person has an optimal breathing strategy because remember, breathing is what leads the deep core system. It's what allows us to manage intra-abdominal pressure. So we want to make sure that the person has good rib excursion, that that diaphragm has room to descend, and that people don't have compensatory mechanisms for breathing. For example, so many of us, especially today, um, are living in super stressful times and we will breathe, we'll chest breathe or we'll um, neck breathe and it will look much more vertical like this, much more vertical than horizontal and diaphragmatic. So another thing that we look at as physical therapists, aside from posture and aside from pressure management, is the person's breathing strategy. How are their core components coordinated is another thing that we look at. Is the diaphragm coordinated with the pelvic floor? Is the deepest transverse abdominus muscle, the deepest abdominal muscle, coordinated with the pelvic floor as well. That's certainly something that we want to look at. Um, and of course, we want to look at pelvic floor strength. So when we're talking about a pelvic organ prolapse, pelvic organ prolapse really is a laxity in the connective tissue. So the pelvic organs are descending from their anatomical position because there's a laxity in the connective tissue. The pelvic floor can provide support like a hammock for those pelvic organs that live right on top of it. So if we're looking at the bladder and the ovaries and the uterus and the fallopian tubes, and they're sitting in the hammock of the pelvic floor, we want to make sure, pretend my hands are the pelvic floor muscles, we want to make sure that that hammock of the pelvic floor is supporting those pelvic organs well. If the pelvic floor muscles are too weak, they won't support the pelvic organs enough, but if we can get them stronger and we can decrease the laxity of the pelvic floor muscles, they can help to keep those pelvic organs in a much more neutral and anatomical position. So we want to assess the strength, the tone, the endurance of the pelvic floor muscles. We want to make sure that the person is recruiting the pelvic floor muscles optimally. And we want to make sure that they're using their pelvic floor with their abdominal wall muscles optimally as well. Um, Lifestyle changes are also really important when we're talking about pelvic organ prolapse. So again, we talked about avoiding constipation. We want to make sure that you are hydrated well. Every muscle, every cell, every tendon, every ligament in your body needs to be hydrated. We want to teach people management techniques to manage their pelvic organ prolapse so that they can um, live as functionally as comfortably as possible. And I just want to interject for a minute and say that I have so many clients that come in with pelvic organ prolapse and with good treatment, people go on to live super healthy, super active lifestyles. I always ask my moms when they come in, what is it that you love doing? Do you love hit? Do you love walking? Do you love just picking up your babies? Do you love running? And our goal will be getting you to that point where you can return to 
activities that you love doing. And it is possible to do all of that living with pelvic organ prolapse. But getting back to lifestyle management issues, um, I digress for a minute, um, letting you all know that healing is possible. But um, we want to make sure that we avoid constipation. We want to make sure we're getting enough fiber. We want to make sure we're hydrated. Sometimes we teach mom, or we teach women to double void. So if women experience a lot of dribbling um, with pelvic organ prolapse, we'll actually tell them to urinate and then they can either change positions, they can stand up, they can do a couple of Kegels and then allow um, the rest of the urine to completely evacuate and very often that can help. Many women with rectocele feel that it's hard to evacuate and sometimes we teach them a splinting technique where we either give them a device or we teach them to put their finger in the back of the vaginal wall or canal to allow the rectum to go into its anatomical position um, in order to allow the stool to fully evacuate. So those are just some of the things that we look at with um, assessment and treatment of pelvic organ prolapse. But I don't want to forget to talk about pessaries. So pessaries are a, an external device that we can insert into the vaginal canal in order to support the pelvic organs better. A lot of times women have um, a lot of hesitation with pessaries and I, I like to teach them that um, although pessaries may not be for everybody, and it's very important to be assessed to make sure that a pessary and the right type of pessary is the right fit for you, but pessaries could be a great part of treatment to help support the pelvic organs, to help decrease the feeling of pressure. Um, and there are many different kinds of pessaries. There are ring pessaries, there are um, donut pessaries, there are platform pessaries, and all of them are designed a little differently to provide a little bit of support. There are cubes pessaries and space occupying pessaries um, to sort of um, give the effect or give the amount of support that each person individually needs. Um, here in the States, physical therapists are not allowed to fit for pessaries, but certainly a urogynecologist can, um, but they can be a great, great adjunct therapy. Um, and I very often encourage women who are struggling um, to at least try pessaries. There's um, an over-the-counter and pessary over-the-counter pessary called the Impressa, which is a great thing to use under the advice of a healthcare professional. If you're not sure that a pessary is really for you, it could be a great thing for you to, um, you know, try and see if the pessary works for you. But I have a lot of women that wear pessaries all the time because they feel more comfortable. I have women who um, I treat who use pessaries just when they're exercising because they want to get back to that higher level of fitness. And until they're absolutely confident that they're managing intra-abdominal pressure well and that they're not breath holding and that their pelvic floor muscles are ready for that, you know, degree of resistance. They use a pessary just for exercising, which is a great um, sort of compromise. So there are so many different ways that you can use pessaries to help you. Um, let's talk for a minute about menopause. And someone asked a question about breastfeeding. So your, your risk factor for pelvic organ prolapse does increase during menopause because we lose estrogen. And when we lose estrogen, we can develop vaginal atrophy, which makes us lose support in our pelvic floor muscles. So we do want to make sure that as we go through the menopausal period that we take care of our pelvic floor muscles. Um, 
and make sure that we're not developing vaginal atrophy. We want to make sure that we're still keeping in mind all of the other concepts um, for pelvic organ prevention, pelvic organ prolapse prevention, such as avoiding constipation, such as managing intra-abdominal pressure, such as not straining, making sure that you're posturally um, optimally aligned for your body. And I, and I just want to note that optimal posture is different for everybody. So um, a lot of times people, you know, stand in my office and I say, okay, we're going to assess posture now. And they're like, I know my mom always said shoulders back, head on. And that's not really what we're looking at. We're looking at that for that perfect position where your rib cage is over your pelvis and your core components are optimally coordinated with each other. That's really what we're talking about when we're talking about postural efficiency and alignment. So during menopause, we wanna make sure that we're paying attention to all that. With breastfeeding, it is true that prolactin, which is um, a breastfeeding hormone, can block estrogen and uh, relaxin, the hormone relaxin is still floating throughout our body, but we have to weigh the benefits and um, the risks. And the benefits of breastfeeding um, tremendously outweigh the risk I don't even think that there is an increased risk of pelvic organ prolapse with breastfeeding. What we want to make sure with breastfeeding is that we are paying attention to posture, that we're paying attention to pressure management, that we are avoiding constipation, that we're working toward good breastfeeding mechanics and posture and nutrition and hydration and pelvic floor engagement. Um, can your pelvic organ prolapse improve after you finish breastfeeding? Absolutely, but there is still so much that we can do during breastfeeding to um, prevent a pelvic organ prolapse from getting worse and even work toward improving a pelvic organ prolapse we see the effects of loss of estrogen much more during menopause than we see the effects of decreased estrogen during breastfeeding. So we never want to encourage breastfeeding moms to stop breastfeeding. There are so many other things that we can do to help improve the pelvic organ prolapse for breastfeeding moms. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I wanted to talk about pelvic organ prolapse. I mean, there's so much that we can talk about um, and it is a, a loaded topic, but I just wanted to do this Facebook Live because I wanted to take the fear out of pelvic organ prolapse. Um, I think it's so important for moms to be knowledgeable about it because knowledge is power. I think it's so important for moms to know their anatomy, but also know that there are so many great conservative treatment options for pelvic organ prolapse. Physical therapy should be your first line of defense. We can, it's, it's a total body approach. It's a total body treatment. And there's so many things that we can do to help you live an asymptomatic, active, healthy lifestyle with pelvic organ prolapse. Um, stay tuned for my next Facebook Live. We're gonna have a really special guest. Um, one of my clients has agreed to do a, a Facebook Live who had pelvic organ prolapse and went on to do any exercise that she wanted to do and she, she did wonderful. And I think it's important to hear those success stories. Um, Please message me if you have any questions. You all know I'm here for you. I'm here to answer any questions that you want. Um, and I just wanna close with saying that there is healing for pelvic organ prolapse. Um, seek the help that you deserve, get the help that you need and know that you could heal. Have an amazing day. Thank you so much for joining me and I look forward to continuing our connection and learning together. Have an amazing day.